We just waiting for the online. The online folks are pouring in now, um, so we're just waiting for them to all get online. And uh, we'll start with that. Well, what was the only issue? Yes, it works. I'm streaming on YouTube and the recording will go on for a couple of days. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you very much indeed for attending, and thank you to all the people online who I think mostly will have joined us now. Um, my name is Simon Thompson. I'm the Chief Executive here at the Geological Society. Um, I'm here um, to introduce Natasha um, for this special public lecture. Um, this lecture is, um, is, is coinciding with activities organised by our courtyard neighbours, the other societies in the courtyard. So I would encourage people after this lecture to go into the courtyard and see what else is, uh, is happening today. And that's coinciding with the coronation. Um, so Natasha, Stephen, um, uh, our, um, our guest and also um, my colleague, um, she studied uh, her undergraduate degree at the Royal Holloway and did a PhD at Imperial and National History Museum, um, linking uh, Martian meteorites with uh, remote observations of the Martian surface. Um, she was then a lecturer at Plymouth and director at an analytical microscopy facility. Um, she's now the Director of Science and Engagement at, here at the Geological Society. Um, and um, I'd like to welcome you, Natasha. We're going to be wrapping up at about 6.15 because they're closing the roads at 6.30. And Natasha, uh, at the very least, has a car here and is going to have to get out um, before they close the roads. Thank you very much, Simon. 
And thank you all for coming, for those of you in the room and for those of you at home as well. As Simon said, there'll be opportunities for questions at the end. And for those of you in the room, we do have meteorites. You can come down and see them, hold them, take photos at the end as well, if you'd like. Um, so it's my pleasure really to give a, a, a talk about some of my research and my interests and what got me interested in geology in the first place. Um, because I am a geologist, but I'm what we call a planetary geologist. I look at rocks from elsewhere in the solar system and the wonders of the other worlds around us, not just the one here that we call home. So when I was asked to come up with a title, I thought, well, what's the one thing that everybody loves about geology? And it's always the fieldwork. Students get really excited about the opportunity of fieldwork during field trips at school and then in their degrees. And even as professional geologists, we love going out into the field when given the opportunity most of the time as well. So as a planetary scientist, it's something that you often have to contend with. You know, can you continue doing geology if you're not out in the field? What are the other ways in which we can explore the solar system around us? And it's a really important distinction because as geologists, we're trained to think about the Earth as a system. It's constantly evolving, the planet around us. It formed billions of years ago. It's constantly evolving, constantly changing. Some parts are being destroyed and recycled and new parts are being formed. All these different cycles working together. But actually the Earth isn't a system on its own. It's part of a much larger one, part of our solar system, which is made of a number of planets and dwarf planets and asteroids and various other objects as well. And each of them is just a little bit different to the next. We have the four inner planets in the solar system, which are rocky, similar to Earth, in that they have solid surfaces. And then the four outer planets, the gas giants, are very different. They have gaseous surfaces, so not really a hard, rocky surface that you can walk across, like here on our own crust. So already we have a huge variety of geology and worlds to explore just in the main bodies within our solar system. But planetary science, unlike geology and unlike the Geological Society of London, is a relatively new endeavour. In fact, the first photo we ever had from, of, from space of our own Earth was taken in 1946, and it's this one just here. It was taken um, from an altitude of 105 kilometres above the Earth, looking down, and it was from a repurposed V2 rocket that was used after the end of the Second World War by the US Army. And I hope you'll agree that in the few decades since then, the quality of the images that we get from space are really quite different. That first one looking down on Earth, seeing clouds and our atmosphere from above for the very first time, to looking at these hugely diverse clouds and systems of atmospheric pressures and colors that we see on Jupiter from the Juno missions. So solar system exploration has come a really long way in a relatively short period of time. We're talking about just 70 or 80 years, and we've sent hundreds of missions out there into the solar system. We know more about the surface of some of the other planets in our solar system than we do about the rocks below the oceans on our own planet here on Earth. And that's largely because curiosity drives geology. We want to know more about the worlds around us. How did we form? When did we form? How have we changed ever since then? And no two of the worlds that you're going to see today are the same, which is partly why we keep going back and we keep wanting to learn more. So as a geologist, how do we do this? Do we all get to be the astronaut walking on the surface of the moon collecting rocks? Well, we'd love to be able to say that was true, but unfortunately it's not. In fact, only one geologist so far, only one scientist who happened to be a geologist so far, Jack Schmidt, has walked on the surface of another body other than the Earth. And he very famously gave a lecture here at the Geological Society in the early 1970s after the return of Apollo 17, which he was on the last mission to the moon, talking about the geology, talking about the rocks he was asked to pick on the lunar surface and bring back. And he said, standing in this very lecture theater in 1970, uh, 1972, that he had to lie to NASA because he couldn't decide which rocks he wanted to bring back. He'd been told he could only bring back a few kilos of rocks. So he had to be really selective about the ones he wanted and he couldn't do it. So he said, I need to bring more back. I need to, I, we need to leave some stuff behind. We've got to prioritize the geology is too good. And he just couldn't decide. So they brought back over 100 kilos of material by the end of the Apollo missions. And he later admitted that actually the rocks were largely very much the same. He just couldn't pick which one was a better example of that particular basalt or that particular north site. Like any typical geologist, the hand luggage went off the scale because he was on a very exciting field trip. But we haven't had geologists on other planetary surfaces since then, or at least not human ones. 
planetary geologists today look a lot more like this. This is the Curiosity rover that landed on Mars back in 2012, or the more recent Perseverance rover that went up with Ingenuity in 2020. And you can see the little Mars copter Ingenuity here, and that's Perseverance having a look, making sure that the copter is absolutely fine. So geologists today look a little bit different on the surface of Mars and the moon, there's moon rovers as well at the moment, but we are working towards putting boots back on the moon with the Artemis missions and eventually going to Mars and further afield. But for people like me who are geologists that want to study these other worlds, it's, it's very challenging to hear about all these fantastic things that happened in the late 1960s and the early 1970s and talking about things that are going to happen in the 2030s and the 2040s and we kind of sat here waiting saying well you know when's it going to be my turn what can I do so we found a way to cope we have a very very unreliable but very exciting natural delivery system that brings rocks here to us on earth I'm sure many of you in the room have seen shooting stars at some point in there uh, in the in the last few years has anyone ever seen a shooting star in the middle of the day, just like this one? No? Sometimes, if you're very lucky, you can see a really, really bright shooting star. It's what we call a fireball. And this is the middle of the day. This is California. And you can see that shooting star, even though the sky is not dark. And that's because unlike shooting stars, which is something coming into the Earth's atmosphere and being destroyed, essentially, it's burning up and fizzling out. You'll think about them fizzling out very disappointing to people like me, that means it never lands. These really, really bright shooting stars that we call fireballs are visible in the daytime because that object is surviving atmospheric entry. It's not burning up at all. It's breaking up normally, but actually it survives. And if we're very, very lucky, something lands on the ground and we can go out and we can try and recover it. And this is what we call a meteorite. Only a meteorite once it's landed on Earth's surface, of course, but some very, very famous examples of some meteorites. So whilst we can't all go out and explore the solar system out there, we can wait for the solar system to come to us and explore it here on Earth, which presents a really unique set of opportunities. So how often does that happen? Well, meteorite fireballs are observed all around the world on all seven continents. There is no pattern to it. There is no preferential treatment. It happens equally across all the continents every year. And you can see reported sightings um, this is just from a couple of years ago, but they continue. It's hard to find them in some places compared to others, and I'll touch on that a little bit later, but they do fall totally randomly all across the world. And in fact, as of last week, we have 71,633 known meteorites here on Earth. So that's how many have been recovered and identified as rocks that originated in space and have landed on the Earth's surface and come into scientific hands. There's probably many, many more that are sat on mantelpieces and being passed down through families with the legend of, oh, granddad found a meteorite out in the garden and brought it in and it's been passed on generation to generation. But scientifically classified meteorites, we have almost 72,000 of them now, which is a huge, huge number. And there are more and more being classified every day. There's lots of ways we talk about meteorites in terms of when they're classified, what types of rocks they are, where they might have come from, how long they've been on Earth. But there's one very simple way in which we can talk about them. And it's an important distinction because when we talk about meteorites, you'll hear scientists like myself, meteorite scientists, meteoriticists, talk about whether it's a fall meteorite or a find meteorite. Has it been seen to fall? We've seen the fireball and we've gone out and collected it directly, hopefully very, very quickly. Or did we just find it? Did we just happen to find it? And we don't have that associated event from space as well. And as you can see here from our 71,633 meteorites that we have, more than 95% of them are find meteorites, opportunistic finds. It's very, very rare that we see those fireball events and we go and recover the stone directly. So that gives us a very, very exciting uh, period of time if we have fireballs just like this one. So how do we predict them? Can we predict them? Not really. They're random. Sometimes we get lots and lots of shooting stars and no fireballs. Sometimes we get lots and lots of fireballs and no associated meteor shower. It's a very different, uh, very different affair. But what we can do as scientists is we can try and track them. So we put cameras up. This is an all sky camera from Australia in Western Australia looking up at the night sky. And you'll see a very dramatic lightning storm. We couldn't have curated this better if we tried. 
And across the bottom of the lightning storm here, hopefully you can see this flash and these dots. This is a meteorite fireball coming in, breaking up in each one of those bright dots is a separate fragment of that meteorite that's separated and then dropped somewhere in the middle of Western Australia, hopefully to be recovered by scientists like myself. So these camera networks are set up all over the place. This is out in the Nullarbor in Western Australia, a solar panel driving energy to the camera that is just set up and simply watching the sky 24 hours a day. And that data automatically downloads to computers and universities and people just plow through the data and models and they let us know, say, oh, we had a bright fireball last night. We captured it on a couple of cameras. So we think it's probably in this area. Do you want to go looking for it? Highly technical, highly skilled, very, very expensive setup with these cameras. And we've got hundreds of them around the world now. But we also have thousands and thousands of cameras that some of you may have yourselves, which give us equally good information. Does anyone have a Nest doorbell at home or a Ring doorbell or a dash cam? We're increasingly getting footage like this. And hopefully you'll be able to see the fireball event up here. This is a very bog standard doorbell camera from someone in Gloucestershire who happened to see the news about a bright fireball event the night before and thought, oh, I'll go check my camera. I wonder if I caught it. And there it is. We got hundreds and hundreds of reports from one fireball and 80% of them were security cameras. They were dash cams for people driving around on a Sunday night. They were from doorbell cameras just like this. So even without the fancy equipment, we were able to work out where that meteorite might have landed. And this was the first fireball that we'd had in the UK for just under 30 years that we thought had landed. So it was really exciting for meteorite scientists like myself. We're used to going elsewhere, trying to find meteorites. So to have one falling on our doorstep, potentially, and being able to sort of work out where it might have landed was really, really exciting. So we were in the middle of Gloucestershire. And we had to sort of work out where this might have gone, where could we go, get to, what's, what's the area going to be like? The UK is quite variable. We've got forests, we've got built up cities, we've got lots of rivers, we've got lots of vegetation, we've got lots of animals. It's not the easiest place to go hunting. So when something like this happens, you literally go out into the field and you do sort of like those CSI searches when you're looking for evidence where you all stand in a line a few metres apart and you walk up and down and keep going and you can see the track from one person there's a few people either side you can see when someone thought they found something everybody ran over to see if it was a meteorite it wasn't so we went back to our original line and carried on just walking through people's fields and gardens with permission to see if we could find the meteorite and we were really lucky on that particular occasion we did find it it landed on somebody's driveway they let us know it was there we went to see them immediately and then we widened the search and we actually found more pieces of it so for that particular meteorite, for Winchcombe, it was really, really successful. And just over a year later, we had another fireball. We couldn't believe it. We hadn't had one for 30 years. And then two came along within 15 months. And this was the terrain we were looking in on that occasion. The UK is highly variable. And we did not find this one. Those are my colleagues. You can see some heads just floating above the, uh, the field of rapeseed there. And uh, we unfortunately didn't find that one. So it's not always quite so simple to find meteorites in the UK. So where do we go to find them? I said earlier, they fall randomly. Well, you can make your life really difficult for yourself and look in fields like this, or you can make life really easy and go into an environment where everything is flat, everything looks the same. So if something has fallen from the sky, it is likely to stand out like a sore thumb on the surface. So we go out looking in deserts. Hot deserts and cold deserts, we go to the Atacama, we go to the Sahara, we go to the Nullarbor in Australia. We also go to Antarctica as well, because something that falls from space typically burns on the outside because space is very cold. And these things might have been in space for hundreds, thousands of years. And our atmosphere is very, very warm. So they tend to blacken on the outside. So if the ground is all white or it's all orange or it's all yellow, something black stands out. So does a lot of other things, particularly in the Nullarbor, but you can normally spot them. So we go out looking. So this was me last week on the Nullarbor. This is the rest of my team here from the University of Monash in Melbourne, from ANU in Canberra and the Australian Synchrotron also in Melbourne, going out into the middle of the Nullarbor. We take everything we need with us in our car, set up camp. We've taken half a ton of water with us and those that is home for the next eight days. And we just walk around. We have little radios. 
We take GPSs so we know where we're getting back to. And we say, okay, see you in three hours, see you at lunchtime. And we all just walk in an opposite direction through ground like this, flat, easy to spot from a few meters away, just constantly looking to see if we can find something. And if we're lucky, we find something like this. This was the first meteorite that I ever found personally back in 2016. This one was actually in the Streslecki Desert out in New South Wales. And it's very small. I have it here with me so you can have a look at it later for those of you that are in the room. And I spotted it from a few meters away. And as soon as I saw it, it looked like a meteorite. People say, oh, well, how do you know? How do you know it's a meteorite? And you do. It's, it sounds really silly. And we always say to new people, you will know when it's a meteorite, I promise you. There are lots of things that you convince yourself look like a meteorite from a few meters away in the Australian outback. There's a lot of kangaroos. There's a lot of wombats. There's a lot of camels. Their droppings all look very much like meteorites from a few meters away. But once you get close enough, you can normally tell. And of course, when you pick it up and you have a much closer look, you can normally work it out pretty quickly. So we're very fortunate. We find meteorites every year. We go out there. We've been going. There's been about 15 years worth of expeditions out to the Nullarbor. And we have just over 300 meteorites now. The one on the left here is the most recent one I found just last week. And I have a piece of that one here as well for you to have a look at. And this is exactly how we find them just on what we call the gibber surface. It's like a limestone cast surface for the geologists in the room and something black sticking out on, on the surface. And this one was found in 2019, also in the Nullarbor, but on a sand dune. So actually a much looser surface. So it probably hadn't been there quite as long as some of the other ones may have been. And we're very fortunate. As I said, we find lots of meteorites. Our expedition in 2019, the last one we did before the pandemic started, was our most prolific expedition yet. We found 46 meteorites in eight days, which is huge. All different meteorites, all from different places. This is them all on the table. And this is when someone said, oh, do you want to hold them all at once? And of course I do. Um, but you can see the size difference. Some of them are really, really large. Some of them are very small. Some of them were broken up into hundreds of pieces of the same meteorite that we found spread over a five, 10 kilometer region sometimes. So it can be a really exciting way to get those samples from space naturally delivered to us without having to spend hundreds of millions of pounds developing rover technology and satellites and launch vehicles not exploding and everything. So it's a reasonably reliable way of being able to get uh, extraterrestrial materials. But that makes it sound all too easy because when you find a meteorite, just like this, that's all the information you have. That's all the context you get. There's no tag on here saying, please return to, I came from Mars or the moon or asteroid 6100B. We don't know where it came from. So we're kind of starting at the end of the story. And now we have to work backwards. We're solving a problem. We have a rock. I want to know where it came from, when it formed, what it's made of, has it changed over time, and how long has it been on Earth's surface? And that's what the field of planetary science can do in terms of meteoritics. We like to study these things and work out where, in the grand scheme of our solar system, these single individual rocks might have come from. And there's ways we can do that based on the types of rocks that we have. No two meteorites are ever identical. We've got very, very similar types and they can be classified in lots of different ways. And the type of meteorite we have kind of gives us an indication as to where it might have come from. If you think about all of the different bodies in our solar system, we have moons, we have asteroids, we have planets, and not all the planets are the same, but all the asteroids are the same either. So when we look inside a meteorite, we will typically cut it initially and have a look on the inside to get away from that burnt exterior, that fusion crust. We can see the different textures on the inside, and they tend to give us a bit of an understanding as to where they might have come from. The most common texture we see on the inside is what we call con chondritic, made of chondrules. And this is a typical chondritic texture. And the chondrules are these round spherical objects that you can see here. They're fully crystalline. They're made of minerals that we're very familiar with here on Earth, pyroxenes, olivines, feldspars. But they're these spherical objects that we just don't get on Earth. They formed in a zero gravity environment and we don't see anything similar in any rocks that form on Earth. So as soon as you see these round spherical objects in your meteorite, you can be pretty sure that you're looking at a meteorite. It's extraterrestrial. It must be because it has chondrules that don't exist anywhere on Earth. And those chondrites come from asteroids that are 
what we call sort of primitive bodies in the solar system. They didn't fully evolve into planets like the Earth did. They're not differentiated like some of the really large asteroids and our moons are. They're not separated into internal layers of cores, mantles and crusts. We get what are called rubble pile asteroids, which are just blocks held together very, very loosely. And as soon as something hits them, it can eject a lot of material. And that's where those chondrites tend to come from. More than 90% of that 71,633 meteorites that we have are these chondrite meteorites. They're incredibly common in terms of meteorites um, themselves. As time went on through solar system evolution, some of these asteroids started to heat. And as they heated, they started to separate into those internal layers. And that internal heating created sort of partial cores, mantles and crusts. And as that continued through the solar system, some of the larger bodies we got fully differentiated planets like our own Earth and the other rocky planets here. And some of them just heated and gave us these sort of global magma oceans. So lots and lots of minerals mixing around together, but not differentiated. And when we look at the inside of meteorites, we can start saying, OK, well, if we've got chondrules, those round spherical things, we know they've come from these primitive asteroids. But what if when we cut open our meteorite, we don't have chondrules at all? What if we have solid metal? I'm sure we've all seen the disaster movies like Armageddon. They're always metallic asteroids and they're very rare, so they shouldn't always be, but they always are. Really dense, heavy, 99% pure, solid iron and nickel metal. And these are crystals. These are natural crystals, the wittmann staten pattern of iron and nickel, what it looks like when it's uninhibited and it grows. These interlocking crystals are like a fingerprint for what we call the iron meteorites. That crystal pattern, the angles at which they intersect, the widths of those crystals, totally different in every iron meteorite. So you can use it as a fingerprint between the different iron meteorites. Some meteorites have a lot of iron in them, but they're not pure iron and nickel. Some of them, like this one, like Imalac, which we have a piece of here at the Geological Society, have got <clears throat> minerals in there as well. These bright crystals, this is a thin slice that's been illuminated behind from behind, so they don't quite glow <clears throat> like this in normal conditions. But these yellowy orange crystals are a mineral called olivine, but it's the gem quality olivine peridot, which is very common in the Earth's mantle. So here we're looking at metals mixed with minerals, and these are what we call the palisite meteorites. So if we go back to our sort of solar system evolution model, we've got our chondrite meteorites here coming from our primitive or our slightly heated meteorites, and then our iron meteorites and our stony iron or palisite meteorites here are starting to come from differentiated bodies. We actually think that those metallic meteorites might be representing the cores of asteroids or other planets, and the mixtures where we have olivine, very common in our own mantle, as well as the metal, and maybe representing a core mantle boundary of an asteroid or another planet as well. And if we've got cores and we've got mantles potentially from other worlds, then we must also have crusts. And we do. Another group of meteorites, the achondritic meteorites, they're non-chondrite meteorites, achondrites, they look very, very similar to terrestrial rocks. If you look at them under the microscope, you can see here with a scale bar, this is a half a millimeter scale bar here. These large crystals are set in a matrix of smaller crystals and these minerals and the elements that make them up are very similar to the rocks that we have here on earth. This is a basalt. It's full of olivine, it's full of pyroxene, it's full of plagioclase. It's a very, very similar basalt to you might find on Hawaii or Iceland but it's extraterrestrial. It came from a volcano out there somewhere else in the solar system, not from here on Earth. So what do these ones look like when you're not looking at them under a microscope? Well, they look pretty boring. This little piece of Mars here that you can come down and have a look at at the end. You can see the black shiny bit on the outside where it's burnt coming through the atmosphere and the fresh surface looks like a very ordinary, very boring rock, but it is a meteorite. This is actually a basalt that came from the surface of Mars. And it's a full meteorite. It was a fireball that was observed in 2012 over the Sahara. And then the University of Casablanca got lots of volunteer PhD students to go out into the desert. And they found it within a couple of months of searching every weekend. They didn't go out every day for three months. That would have been awful. Just at the weekends, they went out and they actually recovered it. This is the Tissant meteorite. And the main mass is on display at the Natural History Museum. And there's a very small piece of it here as well. 
So as soon as you open a meteorite, you get a sense of what you might be looking at. Could I be looking at a planet? Could I be looking at an asteroid? Am I looking at a core? Am I looking at a mantle? Am I looking at an extraterrestrial surface that one day someone might walk across? And even when you get to something as exciting as a Mars rock, you think, oh, that's great. Have we got to the end of the story? Well, no, we haven't because Mars is a big planet and it's incredibly diverse. This is a geological map of the surface of Mars, where each color is a different type of rock on the surface. And you can see we've got some big volcanoes. These are the fastest volcanoes here. This is Olympus Mons, which is the largest volcano anywhere in the solar system, almost three times the height of Mount Everest. We've got a huge impact crater down here in the Southern hemisphere. And there's a lot going on on the surface of Mars. And we're able to create these really detailed maps, even though nobody has gone walking for days, for weeks, for months, like our 17th and 18th century geologists did with the maps outside. We've been doing all of this without ever leaving the Earth. We've got decades worth of observations of Mars, thanks to rovers, satellites, and landers that have been successfully going out to Mars since the 1960s. And this is a, a summary graphic of all the various missions that have gone up to 2021. Um, and there'll be more in the future as well, of course. Some of them more successful than others. But the main thing is that a lot of them are still very much operational. We've got lots of uh, satellites that are constantly mapping the surface of the planet. They're in orbit and sending back data to us here on Earth. So we can look at any particular area of Mars we want to look at, and we can work out what's there from orbit. So let's pick an example. We talked about the Mars rover earlier, Curiosity, who landed in 2012. This is where Curiosity landed. This is Gale Crater, a nice big impact crater. And each color on here is a different mineral that's been determined from orbit. And unlike some of the meteorites that we're looking at, where we're looking at things under microscopes, we're looking at things on a millimeter or even a micrometer scale, when we look at Mars data like this, we have to remember that we're looking at things on a kilometer scale. So this is actually a really huge area and a really huge crater, but we can do it for the whole planet. Because these satellites are constantly orbiting and generating this data, we can cover the entire surface of the planet Mars in the constituent mineral maps doing just this. So let's unwrap the global map and we can have a look at it. Pick a mineral, pyroxene, very, very common mineral, one of the main rock forming minerals here on Earth. And we can have a heat map that shows us where we have observed pyroxene on the surface of Mars and where we haven't. We can say where we found olivine and where we haven't, any mineral we like, we can detect it from space now. And we can do the same thing with our meteorites. So if we take our little piece of Mars that we have here, and we use the same techniques in the lab that we're using in space using satellites, we can generate the same data set. Now, admittedly, it's on a very different scale because this is not a 75 kilometer across sample as the map of Gale Crater was, but we can use the same techniques. So here we have a heat map showing where different minerals are within our little meteorite. So if we apply the same process and say, okay, well, we're really interested in that pyroxene, that really common rock forming mineral and say, okay, where in, my mineral, where in my meteorite here can I see the mineral pyroxene? I can map across the surface and here's my heat map showing me this is where pyroxene is concentrated and this is where pyroxene is absent and you can see the same data represented here. We can compare it to Mars and say, well, that precise signature, that precise sort of fingerprint that I've used, if I take that to Mars, where do I see the match? So here's the match for my meteorite to the surface of Mars in terms of pyroxene but pyroxene's pretty abundant. So it's gonna be quite hard to work out where precisely on the surface of Mars this little rock came from when, you know, 30% of the surface has the same mineral. So let's move on to a different mineral. Let's pick a different fingerprint region. We'll look at olivine now, another very common rock forming mineral that we get here on earth. So here I am in the lab looking at for where olivine is present and where olivine is absent using some particular fingerprint regions, use the same technique on Mars, where do we see olivine on Mars? Far, far fewer options here. 30% of the surface of Mars was covered in pyroxene, but a relatively small percentage of Mars is covered in olivine. So we've got a couple of hotspots. There's one here just on the, uh, the boundary between the northern lowlands and the southern uplands. And you can see some in the bottom of impact craters and down here in Valles Marineris as well. So we've got fewer and fewer options to choose from. 
So let's remember that, we'll come back to it. We'll pick another mineral, carbonate minerals. These are the hydrated phases, like calcium carbonates, calcites, and other hydrated phases such as gypsum. We can see these in the lab, where they're present, where they're absent, you can see here. Use the same signature, put it on the surface of Mars, and where do we see them outcropping on the surface of Mars? Who remembered where we had olivine beforehand? Just up here on the boundary in between the northern and the southern, down here on the edge of the impact craters and across here in the bottom of Valles Marineris. So suddenly we have a couple of locations on Mars where we see multiple minerals matching. And we can keep going. We can pick mineral after mineral after mineral. The more minerals we identify in the lab, we can then take those lab measurements and extrapolate them onto the surface of Mars and we can keep picking. So we can do carbonates, we can do olivines, we can do pyroxenes. We can do appetites, we can do anything we want to and just keep adding and adding and adding and overlaying them on top of each other until you start to see regions where they match, which might give us a better sense of where they come from. And there's the pyroxene overlaying, that 30%, but hopefully you notice that they were also in the bottom of Valles Marineris, the, the boundary between the Northern and the Southern Hemisphere, and again, at the bottom of some of the impact craters. Iron oxide, not so useful on Mars. That's the rusty dust on the surface, which makes it orangey red that you can see. And obviously that's not quite so helpful, but you can build up a picture using the minerals that we identify within our rocks in the lab and using the same techniques out there in space as well. And it gives us a really nice way to sort of pinpoint where some of these things might have come from, if we know where they have come from. So I'm talking about a particular meteorite that came from Mars, which is a singular planet. So when something comes from Mars, we know it's come from Mars. Something's come from an asteroid. We talked about those chondrules, those chondrites that are very, very common. There are lots and lots and lots of asteroids out there in the solar system. We actually don't know how many asteroids are out there in the solar system. Each one of these little dots is a different asteroid. We've got asteroids in the main belt in between Mars and Jupiter. We've got near-Earth objects as well. We've got objects out in the Kuiper belt, which is further on the outer reaches of the solar system. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of these different asteroids. And we don't know what the composition of all of them is. We have mapped several of them the same way that we've mapped Mars and Venus and some of our other planetary neighbors. There's a couple of examples here. Vesta, which is the second largest asteroid in the main belt, was mapped by the Dawn mission. And we do have examples of meteorites that we've matched to, to asteroid Vesta. Ceres is the largest asteroid in our solar system in the main belt. It's actually a dwarf planet. It's nice and large. It's very spherical. It's got these bright spots on it, which we think are uh, hydrated phases, salty phases. And we think we've got meteorites that match up to Ceres as well. Then there were the Japanese missions. Hayabusa actually touched down on asteroid Itakawa and it directly brought material back from the surface of that asteroid to us on Earth. And I have a very small piece of it that we were able to look at. And then when we compared those directly returned samples from Itakawa, we worked out there's a whole group of meteorites in our collection that match. So those meteorites either came from Itakawa or they came from an asteroid that's a very similar type to Itakawa. And once we made those observations, well, that was it. Everybody wanted to go and do these sample return missions to asteroids. So Hayabusa 2 went out to review and we got the samples back last year. And we've been working on that. And we think they've come from a carbonaceous parent body. So we've got carbonaceous meteorites that match. And NASA sent OSIRIS-REx out to uh, asteroid Bennu. These, these were developed independently, but both of these parent bodies are actually remarkably similar. It was quite exciting. And uh, those samples haven't come back yet. They're due back in September this year. So we've got a bit of a deadline to go through our collections and see what we can get that matches the spectral observations ready for sample return. So it's a really exciting way of exploring the solar system, but you kind of have to work backwards. You don't get to pick somewhere that you want to go to and say, well, I want a meteorite from there. We get the meteorite first. And this one, we've only had it on Earth and recognized as a meteorite for you know, less than two weeks. We've now got to do a lot of science to work out where this has come from. We know it hasn't come from Mars. We know it hasn't come from the moon. We know it's come from an asteroid, but we've got tens of thousands of potential parent bodies for us to identify. And some of them we'll never be able to do because we don't map them all. But as space exploration <laughs> continues and the ability to map things like this and bring back these new samples every few years continues, we're creating a much larger and larger data set that we can match up when we do find something like this in the field, 
we can say, okay, well, where has this come from? So I introduced you to this one earlier. This is Manto, my first meteorite from 2016. So let's have a look inside it. This is what it looks like under a microscope. And if I put some elemental data on here as well to give you a sense of the mineralogy for the geologists in the room, we've got a lot of metal. There's a lot of iron metal in here, but we also have a lot of silicate minerals. We've got olivines, we've got pyroxenes, we've got feldspars, we've got magnetites, we've got some pyrites in here. We've even got some apatites and some claw apatites as well. But does anyone recognize anything about the textures in this one? Can you see these? These are those spherical objects that I talked about earlier, those chondrules that you only get in space. They formed in zero gravity. They've round, they've spun and they've created these shapes and these beautiful crystal textures. So we knew as soon as we saw these that we had a chondrite meteorite. We know it's come from an asteroid. We just don't know which one yet. We might not ever identify it. We've got tens of thousands of these chondrite meteorites, but we can look at them in great detail. And they're meteorites, we can't go and get more of them very easily. So we do try and use as many non-destructive techniques as possible using x-rays and CT scans. So you'll see there's a big chunk out of the meteorite here, but there isn't in reality, you can come and have a look. We actually just cut into it virtually. Same way if you break your arm, you don't want a doctor to have to cut into it to tell you you've broken it. Like you'd rather they do that from the outside. We use the same techniques with meteorites to try and preserve them for future generations. Technology is getting better all the time. There are things that we can't learn now that we might be able to in the future. And that was a fantastic legacy of the Apollo missions. They collected so much material. Jack lied, brought back over way over what he was supposed to in terms of the material. But NASA really thought about that in the 1960s and 70s. And they kept a huge amount of material back that was never opened. It was left sealed until last year for the 50th anniversary of the Apollo missions. They started opening up new samples that they never opened before because technology today and the scientific advances that we have to be able to study those samples is so phenomenally different to what it was when they were first collected that we learned so much more in the last year than we would have done in the first 10 years since they came back. And this is the crew of Apollo 11. You'll see the three of them here with the director of the Smithsonian Museum. And bear in mind, two of these people have actually walked on the surface of the moon and brought back physical moon rocks to Earth. They were still this enthralled when they said, hey, look, this is what a meteorite looks like in the Smithsonian collection. So even a moonwalker can still get very, very excited about a very, very ordinary lump of space rock that came to Earth of its own accord. So with that, I will leave it with a quote from Michael Collins about why we explore and why we want to do it as geologists. And I will take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. I think we've got questions from online as well. So Samira and Anthony might appear at some point. There they are. <laughs> Any questions from the room? Well, let me ask you a tangential one. Um, I understand that, that these techniques are not. So I think we're very geological process that can produce these days. I also understand they can also detect seasonal oxygen, but I can't think of a biological uh, process that can do that geologically. I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Not specifically with oxygen, the gases that were measured by the Viking missions, which I think is what you're referring to in the early 1970s, is that correct? No, more um, well, well, recent perseverance and um, the other land uh, atmospheric machines. Oh, insight. Okay. Um, yeah, so they, they have been making those detections and we see lots of things that could be biological signatures, but they're not biological signatures. So we see amino acids in a lot of different rocks that we get from various places in the solar system. We don't necessarily have evidence of direct biotic processes uh, at all yet, but we do have evidence of things changing through time. And as we know on Earth, there are organisms that can live in really extreme environments. And that's one of the reasons why Perseverance is out there, is looking to see if there has been any evidence of past life. We don't think there's any extant life on Mars, but could some kind of organism have lived in an extreme environment at some point in Mars's history? So finding these signatures is really exciting and it's really important because that's what the rover's there to do. But in terms of explaining them yet, we don't have any of the information that we need to be able to do that. 
unfortunately. So it's still very much in its infancy, but that's part of the reason why we find it all so exciting. And that's why we want it to continue. Could you imagine automating the search process rather than wandering around? For rather than, well, rather than wandering around Morocco? It is being done, yeah. So we have a PhD student at the University of Curtin at the moment um, who's working with the group out there, the Desert Fireball Network, and they're actually training a drone to do it for them. Um, so what they do is they go out, take lots of pictures of where meteorites are found, where meteorites are not found, and they're using that as a training data set. So physically throwing meteorites on the floor to see if they can get the pattern recognition software to do it through AI. And it does work, but it does not... At the moment, it's still in its infancy. So it's something that's going to require a lot of people power to sort of get it through and training it up properly. So we have issues with in terms of the resolution of the imaging. So how far the drone has to be above the surface and the area that it can see what the minimum size of the meteorite is going to be. Meteorites are not always black and shiny. If they've been on the surface of Earth for a while, they can weather, they can get rusty, they can go brown, in which case it's harder to find those as well. So the success rate is probably not where we want it to be yet, but it is very much in development. And there's some really exciting results coming out. So one of the things that we've been doing when we were going out is taking people with us and various individuals have been uh, generating that. So uh, Seamus at Curtin is the person to, to ask about that. It's very much his pilot project. Do you know what the track marks are? If it's four meters, is that the asteroid Vesta? So we don't know what they are. There's lots of potential um, explanations for them. So we've got a lot of impact processes on asteroids like that. And we have things like lava tubes that we see on other bodies. And we know that there has been igneous activity on the surface of Vesta because the rocks that we have are volcanic. Um, so it's possible that we have collapse of lava tubes. And that's what you're seeing is streaks, or it could be boulders that are migrating or it could be impact craters that have joined up we see this particularly on some of the other uh, sort of Jovian moons as well where you get clusters of impact craters where gravity is pulling things closer so there's lots of potential explanations but unfortunately the resolution of the data we got from dawn has not allowed us to go in and interrogate that any closer for a definitive answer I don't believe Question online. Um, do you ever find yourself competing with commercial meteorite hunters? Uh, competing is probably the wrong word. So uh, we have a really good relationship with meteorite collectors, meteorite dealers, because meteorites are a commercial commodity. They do have a value, some more so than others. As with anything, it's what people are willing to pay for them. So what we want to do is work in a collaborative way. Science relies on a lot of public money, a lot of investment from private individuals. So actually working with commercial dealers is a really good way to make sure that we get to see the meteorites, because if they're found first by a private individual, you can call it a meteorite, but it's not officially a meteorite until it's been scientifically classified, in which case you need to liaise with the scientists. So we have a really good relationship with people that say, I've got a new meteorite. Can you classify it for me? If you classify it for me, I'll donate the type specimen that needs to be held by a scientific collection. That means that their meteorite is officially a meteorite, it's worth a bit more money. They can say officially what it is and we get to keep a piece of it for science as well. So it's not really a competition, it's more of a collaboration. And, and thankfully that works really well, particularly in the UK, but around the world as well. There's one more line. How useful do you believe meteorites are for inquiry details about the geology of, of our own Earth? There's, there's a big question. So thinking about how life originated on Earth, we have a theory of panspermia where actually all life on Earth originated from elsewhere in the solar system. And that's why we see elements of building blocks of life elsewhere. Whether you believe that, I will let you go away and read yourselves. So there's there's a lot of ways in which meteorites are being used to sort of talk about the history of the Earth, how we evolved, the moon being something that used to be part of the Earth and captured, asteroids, meteorites, all these things forming at a very, very similar time. So what the relationship is between them is really hard to tell with Earth, because unlike a lot of our planetary neighbours, we are being so constantly recycled. We've got plate tectonics, we've got the water cycle, we've got the nitrogen cycle. Nothing stays the same on Earth relatively speaking if you look at mars we've got a relatively dead planet nothing has changed on the surface of mars geologically for 110 million years 
on Earth, we've got lavas that are hours old and we've got basement rocks in Scotland that are four and a half billion years old. So we, we have a huge opportunity to study Earth's history very, very easily, not only because we're here and we can get to it, but you compare that to other places in the solar system and we don't have the same availability. So it's very, very difficult to make those kind of grand assumptions because you are comparing completely different scales. We're looking at something microscopic and inferring a whole planet or a whole asteroid, whereas on Earth, we've got a lot more data points to be able to refer to. So I don't think our understanding is ever going to align quite in the same way. So I see more online. Um, have any new minerals been discovered in meteorites? Yes, we've got lots of new minerals that have been discovered for the first time in meteorites. No new elements. Elements are the same wherever they are in the solar system. But yeah, lots of new minerals are getting discovered all of the time and lots of polymorphs of minerals as well. So we see different forms of minerals like diamonds. We get different forms that form because of the lack of gravity um, when these things are forming elsewhere in space. And totally, totally new minerals have been discovered on the moon. New minerals have been discovered on Mars and in some of the asteroids as well. There's thousands of new minerals being classified all the time, just as many as there are new meteorites. So, yes, absolutely, there are new minerals. Yeah, so one more online. Um, can any structural features be preserved on meteorites? Could they indicate a planet's environment? Absolutely. So there's a big debate going on about when you collect meteorites as to whether you should use a magnet stick to see whether it has metal in it and whether it's magnetic. And it's a really good way to tell whether something has metal in it and if it's magnetic. But you do reset any kind of remnant magnetism that was being preserved from the environment in which it was formed. So there's a whole group of geology concerned with paleomagnetic records and on Earth, we one of the reasons we know about seafloor spreading is because the magnetic pole has reversed and we've been able to track that through time here on Earth. And the same is true elsewhere in the solar system. So using magnets to collect meteorites can reset the paleomagnetic record and upset a lot of people. But there are other ways in which we can talk about the environment in which they formed as well. So we have, if you look up at the moon, it's covered in impact craters. So we know there's been a huge amount of bombardment over the last few billions of years still happening today. New craters being observed thanks to constant imaging on the moon, on Mars and other places. And those impact processes are really, really high energy impacts. And that causes flashes of metamorphism. So really high temperatures, really high pressures that can cause minerals to melt and to deform, minerals to be destroyed, whole new minerals to be formed. And all of those things can be observed directly in meteorites. And we can say, well, we know that this process requires a temperature of 1200 degrees C or a pressure of 40 gigapascals to form. We know those temperatures and pressures don't exist here on Earth. So they must have occurred on whatever that parent body was. And that can tell us something about the environment in which it might have originated in. Is it on an airless body where there isn't an atmosphere that dissipates some of that energy? So those impacts are a lot weaker. Or is it on a body like Mars historically that had a much thicker atmosphere where we wouldn't have had such high energy? So there's a lot of questions, more questions than answers. You answer one question, you open up to another 10 questions. But yeah, absolutely, there's lots of ways in which different meteorites can record different processes from their environments. Um, how can we get the meteorites from Mars? On Earth. How do we get them or how do we know they're from no, Mars? How do they arrive on Earth? I'm, I'm imagining and I can't quite imagine. Randomly. So I like to describe it as a game of leapfrog gone wrong. So everybody in the solar system is moving. Our planets are all in fixed orbits. But there's a lot of loose material out there in the solar system. I showed the graphic earlier of all of those random bodies that are flying around. And every so often something collides. We have an atmosphere here on Earth, so we get protected. And most of the things that come into our atmosphere are those shooting stars that dissipate. They get burnt up. But other places in the solar system don't have thick atmospheres to protect them. So things can come in and smack onto the surface. And if that happens with enough energy, it can cause that material to be thrown up. And there's no atmosphere to trap it and bring it back down to, to the ground. They from, get ejected. From impact on yeah, Mars. absolutely. Really, thank you. And if we're in the wrong place or the right place, depending on your perspective at the right time, but that material might come and land here on Earth. Do you see much of a mineral resources kind of application for some of this, or is that a bit too kind of far away from where we are? Personally or in general? In well. <laughs> 
So yes, there is there is a commercial potential commercial application. So Luxembourg, I think, was the first country to start talking about asteroid mining. They were the first people to sort of stake a claim and say, yep, there's a lot of minerals out there in the solar system that we're running out of here on Earth and we should absolutely be going to mine them. And, you know, we can be reasonably confident that we're not disrupting life and we have planetary protection in place. If we did discover life, we would stop doing anything. So it is a huge, huge, huge area of research. I don't know at what point we get to where it becomes more economically viable to mine something literally in space than it does to do it at home and recycle things that we already have, because it's a huge amount of money just to get there, to set up operations, to run the operations, to excavate the material, and then you have to process it either in situ or bring it back again. So I think the amount of money that's required to do it is, is literally astronomical, and it's probably not economically viable for a while, but in hypothetically, yes, there's, there's a potential there and people are exploring it. The more useful, realistic version of that, I think, is what we call in situ resource utilization, which is being used a lot for space exploration. So if you think about sending astronauts back to the moon, the idea of the Artemis missions is to get people on the moon and to set up a reasonably continual habitable base that they can then travel to Mars or further afield from, so outside of Earth's atmosphere. And we can take all those materials with us and we can build everything, but it's going to be very expensive to do so because the payload is very, very weighty. So ISRU, in situ resource utilization, is considering what resources are there that we can use from the lunar surface already. So can we take 3D printers with us and can we use the lunar regolith, the, the non-biological soil on the surface, as a material to print from? Can we just run it through a 3D printer, melt it, and print a habitat that protects us in an airless body? So that is a much more useful, I think, way of sort of commercializing material, but it's it's commercial in a very different way rather than the true mining potential, I think, which was the original question. There are two online. Um, have you studied meteorites that are so complex you don't know much information about them? Well, I think I'd be lying if I said no to that, and I think anybody would. <laughs> there's, there's so many different types of meteorites, you know, where where we have direct data sets to compare them to, so the moon because of the Apollo missions, Mars because of all the remote and rover data, and the asteroids that we have sample returns, we can make those direct comparisons very, very easily. The harder thing to do is where we have meteorites where we think they've come from an asteroid, but we don't know which asteroid, and we don't even know where to start with trying to work out which asteroid. So some of them can be really, really simple geologically, and we can use our understanding of geology here on Earth to sort of infer what sort of processes we might be talking about. But there are others where we get a lot of hydration, we get what must have been a really water-rich environment to create breakdowns and form lots of clay minerals. And that can be harder to explain because we don't have that endpoint context. So we're kind of working in the opposite direction to a lot of geologists where you excavate something and then you study it. We're kind of We've got it and we can tell you a lot about it, but we've got absolutely no context as to where it's come from. There's no GPS tag. There's no geological mapping. So, so yeah, absolutely. There are lots of meteorites that we're still trying to work out. Um, where is the furthest meteorite known that has landed on Earth from the solar system? That is a hard question to answer. We don't know because we don't know where they've all come from. There's potentially hundreds, if not thousands, of different parent bodies for the meteorites that we have identified in our collection. And we know we've got meteorites that have come from the main belt. So the UK meteorite that we found, Winchcombe, we were actually really lucky. We were able to track. We had so much data, we could track the orbit back into space and we could actually see the orbit um, around in between Mars and Jupiter. We could actually see that particular um, asteroid. So that's, that's quite unusual. We think we've probably got objects from elsewhere in the solar system. It's possible we have Kuiper Belt objects within our collection, but we don't know yet because we don't have those direct comparisons to draw. So hypothetically, anywhere in the solar system, but again, without that geological context, which is what we're so used to as geologists having to start with, it can be quite difficult to make a, a certain observation. Thank you. Uh, the heating as it comes through the atmosphere absolutely does yes depending on the type of meteorite so if you've got a meteorite that's made of metal compared to made of minerals the the differences are, are, 
are, are there. But that fusion crust that I talked about earlier, that burning on the outside is very, very thin. You're talking about just a few tens of micrometers. It's, it's really not very significant, but it depends on the size of the meteor as it's coming through. If it's relatively small, then the relative percentage might be greater than if something much larger comes through and it's only a very, very thin edge. So you can come and have a look and you can see the, the fusion crust on the edge of this is, is absolutely tiny. So it's a, it's a relatively short period of time that things are coming through our atmosphere. So thankfully the damage isn't very significant. No, only a little bit of melting on the outside. And once you get beyond that fusion crust, it's, as far as we understand it, it's almost pristine. <laughs> um, do you have like a specific mission in the, in the future that you're kind of most excited about in terms of helping your research? Space exploration mission or meteorite recovery mission? Well, I, uh, I guess <laughs> space mission for us. Any of the sample return missions, but for me personally, it's the Mars sample return, which is supposed to be. I mean, Perseverance rover has been there since 2020. That's the that's the first part of it. It's actually caching samples on the surface of Mars that it's dropping off for a subsequent mission. The little helicopter that I showed, they're going to send some more helicopters to go and collect them, bring them back to a, a return vehicle and send them back to Earth, which should start in about 2035 for the 10 years. That's the most exciting thing for me. My PhD was on Mars is what I've spent 15 years studying so to actually have directly returned samples from places that we know the geology of so we can stop doing this microscopic analysis and extrapolating up to a whole planet which is absolutely what we don't teach geology students to do unless they do planetary and then it's absolutely fine so having that kind of context for mars personally i think is going to be really really exciting because we it was it's going to answer a lot of questions that we've been able to do with some of the asteroids with Hayabusa, Hayabusa 2 with the OREX as well, that we just haven't been able to do for planets. So Mars sample return, I think, is going to be a huge step change in planetary exploration and planetary geology research as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any more from online? No. Or just the last one. Which, which planet would you like to visit? Mars. Oh, okay. Mars. <laughs> I don't have to think about that one for very long. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for coming, for making the journey to come and see us today. Um, and as I said earlier, um, if you do get the opportunity to go into the courtyard and see what some of our sister learned societies are doing, um, you know, please, it's a lovely evening, please do so. And if you want to come and see the meteorites, you're welcome to come down and handle them at the front. You can come and uh, take photos or whatever as well. Hi. Which one do you want to see? Which one? Put your hands out. Wow. That's a piece of the moon, and that's Mars. So they're both meteorites, and if you flip them over, you can see this one's got that black shiny. So that's thing on it. the that's the fusion crust. So that's where it's burnt coming in, and then that's the fresh rock so underneath. So this the size when it arrived, or is this a part of? It was. It was part of that right. larger one that I showed in the in the gloved hands. Yeah. But it broke as it came into. The Earth's atmosphere. So we got lots of small pieces as well as a big one kilo piece, which is great because the kilo pieces in the museum and all the small pieces we get to study for science. Do you find that laying on the ground? You know, once you know it's there, you spend hours looking. Oh, no, sorry, was it? And that's the Mars one. So this was found in Morocco in 2013. Sure. In oh, this one found? That one was also found in Morocco. This is a lunar meteorite. Um, I've been to the Natural History Museum with the big one that's in the um. It's sort of in a cage, so no one can run away with it, but it's, it's absolutely huge. It is huge, yeah. And it's really heavy. Some of them are massive. The largest one was Hobo, it's tens of tons. Yeah, yeah. right, so yeah. that was made a bit of a smash. Yeah, it has to move since it landed. They right. built a display case around it. That was fantastic. It's got the strange. Right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go because I think it's going to be quite difficult to it's get. It's going to be a challenge this yeah, evening, yeah. It's uh, <laughs> fantastic. Thank so, you. So Thank you. Make sure you get out of here. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the okay. talk. Okay. You're welcome. And where were the others from? So this is from Vesta. This is from asteroid 4 Vesta, uh, which is the second largest asteroid in the main belt in between Mars and Jupiter. And this is an unknown parent body. This is an asteroid um, somewhere in the main belt. This is what we call an enzatite chondrite. So this one has the round spherical objects in it, and this one doesn't. It's very, very crystalline. This is the one, got last this is week. The one No, this is the one that I found in 2016. This Can is I the one that I found last week. Oh. And where were these found? 
Uh, this one was Morocco and this one.